There's been a bit of discussion recently online about potential hidden dangers of fruit and honey. I saw a few comments on YouTube and I wanted to do a video in response to this. As many of you know, I'm a huge advocate for including fruit and honey in the human diet. And in this video, I'm going to show you why hemoglobin A1C does actually measure fructose glycation so that you would know if you had any problems with excess fructose in your body. Number two, I'm going to show you that fruit has repeatedly been shown to be healthy in the human diet. And number three, I'm going to show you some hidden dangers of a ketogenic diet that are not being talked about that are connected with this whole conversation that I think will bring much of this into focus. So let's start with the overarching framework of this conversation. Fructose is a sugar. It's present in foods like fruit and honey. Now, those foods also contain sugars like glucose. And if you're drinking milk, you're gonna get a sugar called galactose as part of the disaccharide lactose. So the three main sugars that humans come in contact with in our daily lives are glucose, galactose, and fructose. With, as I mentioned, honey and fruit being the primary dietary sources of fructose. Now, within the ketogenic community, there are many people who fear fructose. I've done multiple podcasts on this and had multiple conversations with people on the other side of this issue on my podcast in which I've presented a significant amount of evidence that fructose in food form is not harmful for humans. Whenever we're talking about fructose in the human diet, we have to be careful that we don't conflate studies that are administering pure fructose or high fructose corn syrup to humans or animals with studies looking at whole food sources of fructose. Those are things like honey and fruit. The latter set of studies diverges significantly from the former set of studies, probably because things like processed sugars, including high fructose corn syrup, contain corn starch that is not accounted for in the calories on the label, adding extra calories to these foods and potentially crossing the gut lining, leading to inflammation when these undigested starches get into the blood. So I think most people would agree, high fructose corn syrup, harmful for humans. We've seen that in human trials. Many trials in rodent studies will use pure fructose. This is harmful to rodents. That's very clear in rodent studies because rodents would never eat pure fructose and humans would never eat pure fructose either. Often these sugars are given to rodents as part of what have been called crap in a bag diets that also include seed oils and grains and other refined ingredients. So when we're looking at rodent studies, if we find that fructose is harmful in rodents, we should not be surprised. But if you look at human feeding studies of whole food forms of fructose, and I will show you some of these later in this podcast, or observational studies looking at fruit consumption, what you find is that fruit and honey are beneficial for humans, and there's really no interventional, randomized controlled trial evidence that fruit and honey are harmful for humans. So with this in mind, I think that some folks go looking for mechanistic reasons that are unsupported by science to say that fruit and honey are harmful. The current misconception noted within the health sphere is that fructose glycation of hemoglobin is not measured by any lab tests that we have commercially available for humans. This is wrong, and I will show you evidence for this very clearly in one moment. Both the hemoglobin A1C assay and the fructosamine assay, which is measuring sugars, either glucose, galactose, or fructose, bound to an albumin molecule, while the hemoglobin A1C test measures those sugars bound to a hemoglobin molecule, both of those tests do rise when excess amounts of fructose are consumed. So with that stated, it's important to understand that if in fact eating fruit and honey was very bad for you, we would see a rise in your hemoglobin A1C to pathological levels. Generally, a level of 5.6 on a hemoglobin A1C is what's accepted to be normal, and below that and above that is expected to be pathological. Hemoglobin A1C is a proxy for the average blood sugar, but as I stated, it is clear from experimental studies in mammals that when you feed mammals, which have the exact same blood chemistry as us and are going to have the exact same chemical reactions happening in their blood when a sugar molecule attaches to a hemoglobin as us, when you feed mammals, excess fructose, you see a rise in both hemoglobin A1C and fructose. So there are no hidden dangers here. If there is a danger to fructose in whole food form, fruit and honey, which is what's being discussed here, we would see it in the hemoglobin A1C. 
and we do not see that. So let me show you a study done in rats. These are mammals. Again, the chemistry by which this sugar molecule is going to glycate their albumin and their hemoglobin is entirely equivalent to ours. And as I mentioned earlier, fructose in rats is not a good thing. So we know that the outcome of this trial is bad because giving these rats fructose leads to excess oxidative stress. As I mentioned earlier, the same is not seen when we feed rats honey and in humans, we do not see the same effects with fruit or honey in whole food form. And I'll show you those later. So let me show you a study in mammals that clearly shows that there is no hidden danger with fructose because you will see all of the glycation reflected in the hemoglobin A1C and the fructosamine assay. So here's the study that I want to note. The title is Long-Term Fructose Consumption Accelerates Glycation and Several Age-Related Variables in Male Rats. As I said, feeding rats pure fructose is really bad. But the point of me showing you this is to prove that if the levels of fructose in your blood go up with consumption, you will see this reflected in your hemoglobin A1C and your fructosamine. The chemistry happening in these rats' blood is exactly the same as ours. These are chemistry reactions by which a sugar is attaching to a protein. It's exactly like ours. So if you look here in table one for this paper, you will see these rats, they are fed 250 grams per liter solutions of fructose, glucose, or sucrose for one year. And you can see here is the water fed group, the glucose fed group, the sucrose fed group. So that's a disaccharide of glucose and fructose and the fructose fed group. Notably, the blood glucose levels for all of the intervention arms of this trial, glucose, sucrose, and fructose, are all pretty similar, which is going to be important when we're looking at the hemoglobin A1C level and the fructosamine level. You can see the blood fructose levels here. Not surprisingly, the glucose-fed group has a low level of blood fructose. The sucrose-fed group has a slightly higher level, not 100x or anything like that. And the fructose-fed group, pure fructose-fed group, has a higher level of fructose in their blood. If you look at the fructosamine assay, you see very clearly that the fructose fed group sees a rise in the fructosamine assay, similarly to the hemoglobin A1C. So this column right here is the blood glycated hemoglobin, clearly showing that when you feed mammals high levels of fructose and you get high levels of fructose in the blood, you get an increase in the hemoglobin A1C. There is no hidden danger to fructose. I'm not saying that feeding humans or rats pure fructose is good. What I am proving to you with this study is that in mammals, if the blood levels of fructose rise in a significant fashion, you will see this reflected in both the fructosamine and the hemoglobin A1C. Notably, the sucrose fed group did not really see any increase in their hemoglobin A1C above the glucose fed group. But again, both fructosamine, which is sugars attached to albumin, and the hemoglobin A1C increased significantly in the purely fructose-fed rats. So just to be 100% crystal clear about this one more time, if you are eating fruit and honey and you are worried, just check a hemoglobin A1C. I've checked my hemoglobin A1C. I've shared it multiple times on my blood work. It's within normal. My hemoglobin A1C is not elevated to excess because eating fruit and honey is not harmful for humans and doesn't seem to physiologically cause excess levels of glycation in us. If you're looking for some substantiation of that statement, I would direct your attention to this meta-analysis, which shows that total fructose-containing sugars had no harmful effect on any outcome in substitution or subtraction studies with a decrease seen in hemoglobin A1C in substitution studies. Furthermore, there was an interaction by food source with specific food sources showing beneficial effects, fruit and fruit juice, or harmful effects, sweetened milk and mixed sources. In the conclusions here, you can see, although most food sources of these sugars, especially fruit, do not have a harmful effect in energy match substitutions with other macronutrients, several food sources of fructose containing sugars, especially sugar sweetened beverages containing high fructose corn syrup, adding excess energy to diets have harmful effects. No surprise there. But in everything that I've done, I've always differentiated my recommendations that you consume fruit and honey from you consuming high fructose corn syrup or processed sugars. Furthermore, let me show you these quick studies 
substantiating the fact that fruit can be very beneficial for humans. We have two studies here, the first one showing that a seven-day consumption of red-orange juice ameliorates endothelial function, that means it improves it, and reduces inflammation in non-diabetic subjects with increased cardiovascular risk. That doesn't sound like fructose is doing something bad, does it? And yet another one here. This study shows that the intake of a single portion of blood orange juice provided early protection of mononuclear blood cells from oxidative DNA damage. And they go on to note that the protective effects were not explained by vitamin C because they had a parallel arm in which vitamin C was given. Thus, other phytochemicals could be involved. So what they're saying is that giving blood orange juice improves endothelial function. It improves oxidative stress markers. It provided protection from oxidative stress from mononuclear blood cells, and that wasn't explained exclusively by vitamin C. So there's a lot of evidence that fruit and honey are beneficial for humans. And if you were worried about this, you would see it on your hemoglobin A1C as I showed you in the rat study. But let's get to something really important that we must talk about in this video. What we're talking about here are advanced glycation end products. And the assertion by the ketogenic community was that fructose increased advanced glycation end products like hemoglobin A1C in a way that we wouldn't see them. I've shown you very clearly that is not true. And what the ketogenic community is not talking about here is the fact that ketogenic diets themselves cause advanced glycation end products to increase. And not just any advanced glycation end product, an advanced glycation end product called methylglyoxal, which is clearly known to be harmful to humans, allow me to substantiate these claims. The title of this study really says it all. Ketosis leads to increased methylglyoxal production on the Atkins diet. You see here that even people who didn't get into ketosis on the Atkins diet increase methylglyoxal at a level of 1.67 fold. And they go on to say that samples from subjects with ketosis showed even greater increases in methylglyoxal 2.12 fold. That's probably not a good thing. If you had any doubts about methylglyoxal, consider these papers. The title of this paper is also quite revealing. Methylglyoxal promotes oxidative stress and endothelial dysfunction. That's not good. The conclusion of this study, which is done in rats, is that the present study provides further evidence for methylglyoxal as one of the causative factors in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis and the development of macrovascular diabetic complication. And then I'll show you one more study here. Title of this one, Oxidative Stress and Aging. Is methylglyoxal the hidden enemy? So we've basically gone from hidden dangers of fruit and honey, which don't exist, to hidden dangers of a ketogenic diet. If you're concerned about advanced glycation end products gumming up your physiology, and we know that methylglyoxal increases on a ketogenic diet and that methylglyoxal has clearly been shown to create oxidative stress, this may be a hidden enemy if you are restricting things like fruit and honey and not getting carbohydrates. You can see here in this paper, the authors clearly state an excess of methylglyoxal formation can increase ROS, reactive oxygen species production, and cause oxidative stress. Methylglyoxal reacts with proteins, DNA, and other biomolecules, and is a major precursor of advanced glycation end products. I don't believe there are any hidden dangers of fruit and honey. And I showed you that in mammals, if the levels of fructose in your blood rise to any significant degree, your levels of both fructosamine and hemoglobin A1C will reflect that. In my labs, in the labs of everyone I've worked with, I've never seen that happen, and there's really no documentation in the literature of that happening at all. In fact, the meta-analysis I showed you suggests that in studies of substitution and subtraction with fructose-containing foods, hemoglobin A1C often drops. Then I showed you a few studies corroborating the notion that fruit can be beneficial for humans, both protecting from oxidative stress and improving endothelial function, which is going to improve markers of vascular health and cardiovascular disease long-term. And then at the end of the video, we talked about some of the hidden dangers of a ketogenic diet, which can actually increase advanced glycation end products which is what we were worried about in the first place with all of this. So this is all really important discussion. I respect all of these folks in the ketogenic community. Most of them are really good friends of mine and I love these discussions and I hope that they further our collective understanding so that we can all become healthier as a result.